All right, let's get it started. Hello, hi everyone. My name is Logan Hicks. I'm going to be your moderator for this session. Uh, the session is titled United States Army Corps of Engineers Regulatory Division, Regulatory 101. Uh, please use the uh, question, the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen there to ask any and all questions during this uh, presentation. I got, a, I got a heads up from Shane that he is definitely encouraged that you ask questions, so uh, feel free to do so, and we will answer them live for you. Um, but without any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Shane McCoy. Shane has uh, 14 years of regulatory experience with the Corps as the project manager. Um, he's section chief in two branches of the Alaska, Dis Alaska District, the program manager of the Alaska District, and he was a uh, branch chief in Honolulu for four temporary details between 2016 and now. So uh, welcome, uh, please help me in welcoming Mr. Shane McCoy. Good morning, Shane. Good morning, Logan. Uh, thank you very much. I still see a couple people dropping in, so I'm gonna give it just a minute and then I'll begin. Um, but thank you for the, the welcome. I have held all of those positions. Um, I don't currently hold all of those positions. I'm currently uh, uh, the program manager in Alaska District doing a, a detail as the branch uh, chief here in Honolulu. So thanks for having me. <clears throat> well, I will begin uh, right now. So as I said, my name is Shane McCoy. Um, I have been uh, working in Alaska District for my entire career with the regulatory division, um, other than the, the opportunities that I've had here in Honolulu. And they are very uh, similar and very different. Um, the slide I'm showing you right now is uh, the district's uh, area of responsibility. Uh, we cover the entire South Pacific, uh, uh, the territories and, uh, and the uh, state of all of Hala uh, uh, Hawaii. Sorry if I'm a little nervous. Um, so we do have quite a, quite a large geographic um, area of responsibility. Um, we do have one uh, person and a field office in, in Guam, um, which has been very helpful for us, um, you know, uh, fulfilling our mission in the, in the South Pacific. Um, let's see. So what is our mission? Our mission is to protect the, the nation's waters, uh, aquatic resources and navigation capacity while allow, allowing reasonable development through fair, flexible and balanced permit decisions. Um, we are a permitting agency. Um, other like, un, unlike other uh, fingers of the core, uh, we are not proponents or opponents of projects, but rather we review uh, projects uh, and applications when they come in. Um, and DOT is a very large one of our stakeholders here in the, in the district. Let's see. Whoops, sorry. Um, our, our authorities um, stem from Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act of uh, 1899. Uh, which was originally called um, the the um, excuse me uh, the Refuse Act, um, and primarily primarily ensures free and open navigability of the waters of the United States, but it also prohibited the discharge of refuse matter of any kind or description, whatever, other than that flowing from uh, streets and sewers and passing therefrom in a liquid state into any navigable waters of the United States. So. The Corps of Engineers, uh, Department of the Army, has been uh, a regulatory agency for uh, a long time, 122 years, uh, to be honest. Um, and then in 1969, a couple of uh, very notable environmental uh, actions came up. Uh, one of them was 3 million uh, gallons of crude oil was spilled um, off the coast of California, um, which just happened to be right in front of President Nixon's house. Um, as well as uh, the Cuyahoga River uh, catching fire. Um, so in 1972, Congress passed uh, what, is called, what was called um, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, um, which is commonly called the Clean Water Act, which is one of our primary regulatory authorities uh, under Section 404 of that act. Uh, under Section 404 of that act, um, any actions that result in a discharge of dredge or fill material into waters of the United States uh, require authorization from the Corps. There are, we have uh, other authorities under Section 9 of the Rivers and Harbors Act and uh, Section 103 of uh, the Marine Sanctuaries Protection and Research Act. Uh, and that, that is primarily Section 103, I'll call it, is uh, our authority is for the transport of uh, dredged materials for ocean disposal. Um, the other portion of that is for the disposal itself. EPA has the authority under that. Um, any questions to date on this? Okay, next. Uh, common Section 10 activities, um, as you guys are aware, 
uh, any dredging uh, of federal uh, or of uh, non-federal navigation channels uh, requires authorization from us. Um, the construction of uh, piers, wharfs, jetties, um, the, uh, the, the addition of mooring buoys, things like that are, are all regulated under section 10 of our authority. Um, and uh, yep. and uh, when do you need uh, a permit? Um, um, in tidal and fresh waters, um, the discharge of fill material for sure under 404. So temporary and permanent um, activities that would re result in um, discharge of fill material, um, that, which includes the mechanized pushing of sediment uh, or sands um, in unlined streams or in tidal waters, all requires a section 404 permit. Um, other activities that are we commonly authorize are uh, uh, anything that requires a bank stabilization that would require the discharge of fill at or below the ordinary high water mark of a, wa a fresh water or uh, the high tide line of tidal waters, um, boat ramps, uh, the fish ponds um, around, the, around the states, um, any residential or commercial development, um, beach nourishment, seawall construction, um, and uh, similar activities. There is a, an interesting exemption in our, uh, under section 404. Um, you do not need authorization uh, from us if it is the maintenance of uh, an existing structure where you do not change the character, scope, or size of the original fill. Um, examples would be um, uh, like around flood control channels uh, to remove those sediments and stuff does not require authorization from us. Uh, replacing dislodged stones uh, from bank stabilization or groins do not require a 404 permit unless it's in uh, tidal waters or navigable waters of the United States. So under Section 10, everything needs to be looked at uh, by us just to make sure that uh, our primary concern under Section 10, again, is uh, making sure that the, the public has their free right to navigation. So um, any questions yet? I'm moving pretty quick here, sorry. Uh, we got a, yeah, we have one question. Um, does section 404 permit uh, moving of existing sand and channel from point to point in a tidal zone? Uh, what's the question? Yes, that if it's in a tidal zone, yes. Yeah, so does the, does the section 404 permit moving of the existing sand in that channel? Yes, that, that would require a 404 permit. It, it, well, de uh, okay, so here's the regulator in me, uh, depends. Um, I'd need more specificity. And so this is, my recommendation always to people is uh, it's better to ask permission than forgiveness. Um, there are there are times when it would not, um, but there are absolutely times when it would need a 404 permit. And I know that's not a, a very satiating answer, um, but it really is uh, really depends on you know whether it was previously authorized, where the where the work is, what the material is. Um, for for instance, I think what the question is: Can you remove materials without a 404 permit? You absolutely can if it's not a section 10 water. Um, and you can absolutely remove materials if, if it's a one step grab. And so, what I mean by that is if you grab material and move it to an upland or off site where it's not regulated uh, fill, um, you don't need authorization from us. Um, typically, though, if you're pushing, pushing sand, um, like to open up a stream or something like that, that requires authorization from us. Um, and also author authorization uh, under both probably 10 and 404. But I will say the death is in the details um, and every project is a case by case. So uh, I, I know that's probably, did that answer the question, whoever asked it? Um, I'm sure it does. Uh, let me extrapolate a little bit further. Like, so like, you know, like the, how, if you go out west side on Oahu, there's those channels of sand and everything moving it. Uh, is that, um, is that uh, does, it, does that require a 404 permit to uh, move those sands? When you say channels of sands, uh, can you elaborate? Uh, there's uh, drainage channels that you know go out to the uh, that go out to the ocean um, that all have um, you know like those. Like a lot of times they get blocked with sand, and then every once in a while you see them moving it. Uh, do those? Does that require 404 permitting? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna punt again and say it depends. Depends how they're doing it, and it also depends if those channels are jurisdictional. So not everything that conveys water is actually a jurisdictional water of the United States. Um, and unfortunately for the regulated public and the regulators, um, 
our jurisdiction and other laws have been um, moving back and forth with regards to what is jurisdictional, what is not um, over the last couple of administrations. So I would suggest that if, if that is a, a maintenance requirement needed, that you should talk to us, uh, at least ask, um, and then we can have a better, better, more informed conversation. But um, not knowing all the details, I can't tell you one if it's a jurisdictional uh, feature or not, and then if the activity would be regulated. So that's right. our the first step we always do is we try to figure out if it's a uh, jurisdictional waters first, you know, and like I said, uh, the recent administrations have flip flopped some of the, some of the, um, uh, the waters that would be required to be, um, uh, regulated under 404 and some that would not. So, uh, I'm sorry to punt and say it depends, but it, it really does just depend. Okay. Well, that, uh, that's, uh, seemed to spark a couple more questions if you don't mind. Um, no, I love it. Uh, what about filled areas that have low elevations that collect water? In this case, USFWS has mapped a portion of the man-made land area as freshwater emergent wetland. Um, again, I'm gonna say maybe. So all of our authorities come from the Commerce Clause um, in, the, in the Constitution. Um, if those under the current uh, laws and regulations, um, maybe so, maybe not. If, if they have influence on a navigable water, um, yes, probably. Um, I'm going to caveat that to say that they're um, under this current jurisdictional um, paradigm that there are waters that can qualify as uh, uh, wetlands, um, but they could be isolated and wouldn't be regulated. There was a court case in, in um, it's the Solid Waste Agency of Cook County, they call it commonly called Swank, um, that removed jurisdiction on isolated bodies of water. Um, that being said, is since you brought up the Fish and Wildlife's National Wetland Inventory, um, that's a, that was created using aerial imagery and vegetation signatures. Um, the definition of a wetland is an area that's inundated or saturated at a frequency under normal uh, situations that supports a, a prevalence of hydrophytic vegetation. So um, those boundaries on those maps are a good place for us to start. Um, we use them in making jurisdictional determinations uh, all the time. However, um, to truly delineate and figure out if it's a, a boundary or a, a, a wetland, uh, there's three criteria that need to be satisfied, and only the core um, and uh, 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 NRCS um, can uh, designate them as as truly wetlands, and then the core will determine whether or not they're jurisdictional. So to be a wetland, they have to um, have uh, hydrophytic vegetation. They have to have soils that um, have go anaerobic enough to create um, uh, indicators that they go anaerobic enough to support the vegetation, and then they also have to have hydrology um, under normal circumstances. Uh, present um, at near the surface. Um, so if you think you have a wetland uh, based on NWI or other mapping um, and it hasn't been approved by the Corps, it may or may not be a wetland. Um, so again, I'm sorry for being the regulator saying depends, but it really does depend. Um, I would say to be on the safe side, more than likely, uh, especially in, in Hawaii, uh, that if it's mapped as a, a wetland by NWI, even if it's a lowland area, um, it's probably uh, got you know subsurface connections to navigable waters and would likely require authorization under our program for sure. Gotcha. All right. Um, another question, if you don't mind, is uh, is micro tunneling or directional drilling underneath a U.S. water stream exempt from the 404 or USACE permits? If all underground, if all work is underground and no disturbances to the ground or within the high water mark or the stream, uh, there's no actual work in the stream itself. Yeah, as long as it's not regulated under uh, Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. And so anything on over under uh, a Section 10 water, um, you know, within reason needs to be authorized. Um, and the, the geographic boundaries on the tidal water is the uh, uh, mean high watermark um, of, the, of the ocean. So if you're, you know, uh, I guess drilling like an outfall that was going to go in, you know, entirely from the upland out to the ocean, that would absolutely need uh, authorization from us, not under 404, but under 10. Um, uh, directionally drilling under a stream that isn't um, uh, regulated under Section 10 does not require, as long as there's no you know, discharge in, from the, the staging areas, so to speak. Awesome. And that's an important consideration too. So when you're applying for a permit, again, staging areas and temporary impacts uh, need to be authorized by us as well. Awesome, all right, that's, uh, that's all the questions we have for now. Okay. Thank you. As you're aware, um, we have to comply with all federal laws, um, and these aren't all of them. Uh, you know, so 
I guess the, the uh, lead into this is we coordinate with the different um, agencies that uh, with responsibility under these different um, acts. Uh, we do our own NEPA. Um, and section 408 there at the bottom right there in, is, is a reference to uh, any federal project or lands owned by the, the, the uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers. So all the uh, navigation channels and all the uh, dikes, levees, dams that the Corps has uh, built and maintains, uh, we have to coordinate um, in-house with that as well. Um, I put this in here not only to uh, you know, show all the cross-cutting federal laws that are applicable in a, to our program and to your applications, but to also give you the understanding that um, we're moving as fast as we can. However, uh, there's other agencies involved that we have to coordinate with. Um, so you need lead time. And I'm sure everyone who has gone through a permitting process understands that you know, the Endangered Species Act has some timelines, um, uh, very dictatorial in the, in the most recent uh, version of the PSA. Um, but they are, they're not, um, you know, like all agencies, I'm sure your, your agencies included, uh, there's only so much staff and only so much resource to be, uh, to, to put towards these things and everybody has a full load. Um, now that being said is there's procedural requirements under all of these, including like the essential fish habitat, uh, where if we get, uh, conservation recommendations, we have to respond to those. Oftentimes they're coordinated with the applicant. Um, oftentimes they're incorporated as special conditions to a, a permit. Uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, um, I'm sure everybody in Honolulu and uh, Hawaii is aware, uh, there's so much history here um, that you really cannot uh, get away from some sort of impact typically for any project. Uh, um, honestly, that doesn't need coordination under Section 106 of the NHPA. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, we coordinate with Fish and Wildlife uh, for both endangered species and other concerns uh, that they may have. Uh, the, of course, the Coastal Zone Management Act that's uh, implemented by the state, uh, the 401 Water Quality Certification from the Department of Health here in the Hawaii. Uh, these are all, all um, other agency coordinations that we have to fulfill before we can issue a permit or deny a permit or issue a permit with special conditions. Um, like I said, I put this in here simply to, to keep everybody informed that um, we're working as fast as we can, but there's, there's uh, other uh, constituent uh, portions of our of our pro program that um, are somewhat out of our hands, um, you know. But that being said, um, everybody wants to do the right thing. So, hey, uh, Shane, I got a question. Yes. We got a question that popped up. Yep. Um, it's uh, can community members remove landslide debris and or sediment from channelized streams to mitigate flood risk? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if if it's a, a water body that's only regulated under Section four hundred four. Um, if they're if they're just pulling it out and, and putting it up in an upland or some other place, they absolutely can do that. Yes, with, without without a permit. But if if they're in there with a dozer or something pushing stuff around, uh, they would have to get authorization from us. That's considered fill. Excellent. Thank you. I will also say it's a, a little bit not intuitive, but um, dredge material that's pulled out of waters um, and placed in uplands, uh, if that water is not contained. Um, that return water into waters of the U.S. is also considered a 404 discharge. Um, it's one of those uh, unique uh, things in our regulations that caught me off guard prior to me, um, you know, starting in the program. But I will caution you, that's a good reason to dewater in a place where the waters themselves are not going to um, re-enter. Now, that being said, is we have two types of permits, and there's a general permits, which are like nationwide permits, regional general permits. Um, we have nationwide permits, which are typically reissued every every five years. Uh, we had a round that came out in 20, well, the last ones that most of them are working under came out in 2017. Um, so we're in the process right now of reissuing 40 of those and issuing one new one. There was also a round of 16 that were reissued in uh, 2020. Um, and, and, and that return water is covered under a nationwide permit. They're considered so minimal in nature um, that uh, they don't require uh, much coordination and, uh, and, and as much uh, scrutiny, I would say, because like I said, they're small in nature. The thresholds on them are, are so uh, restrictive that um, they've been determined that they're, that they're um, eligible for verification. And, and what I mean by that is you, you send in an application to us and we figure out whether or not it fits the terms and conditions of a nationwide or general permit, and then we verify that it does. And, and oftentimes it will involve us adding special conditions to uh, make sure that they are uh, each one of those actions uh, individually and cumulatively doesn't um, adversely impact our aquatic systems. 
Uh, for larger projects or projects that don't fit one of the nationwide or general permits, um, we have individual permits. Uh, those require a public notice period uh, where the public has an opportunity to comment on the project. Uh, the comments that are within our, our purview, that are within our regulatory authority, uh, we would uh, forward them onto the applicant. The applicant has to address those uh, to the satisfaction of our, regula our regulatory uh, constraints. Um, and those, like I said, are uh, generally um, issued for the construction of an activity. Um, I'd like to be clear that um, our, our um, permits are construction permits. They're not operation permits. So the, the things, if you're going to build a, uh, a harbor, our, our purview under NEPA and other uh, public interest review and the 404B1 guidelines is really for the impacts directly associated with the construction. Now, NEPA broadens that uh, quite a bit, um, depending on the level of the impact. And then we will take into consideration um, operational uh, constraints and disclose that in our NEPA document. Um, but our, like I said, our, our, our regulatory purview is really the, the construction of a road, uh, not so much the, the operation of vehicles on the road, uh, the, you know, the, that kind of stuff. Um, now, that being said, was we also have letters of permission, uh, which are um, uh, a much smaller type of an individual permit. It does not require a public notice. Um, it does, however, require a 15-day agency coordination letter where we coordinate with uh, the, different agent, the uh, different resource agencies, um, including Fish and Wildlife and EPA and, and all of the other players. Um, but it doesn't require um, public input uh, and scoping, so to speak. Um, as you can see, the general permits, um, our processing time, the, the target is 60 days. Um, sometimes they go longer than that um, simply because of a lack of information um, from the applicant or uh, you know, other, other coordinations that I showed you earlier, the Endangered Species Act or Section 106. Um, those, those actions can take a lot longer than 60 days, as I'm sure all of you are aware. Um, but standard permits, our target is 120 days, um, simply because of the, the level of involvement from the public um, and the different agencies. They are often a lot, a lot more controversial. Um, they definitely have some uh, other challenges as well. Um, but those are our, our goals. Um, and uh, you know, if, if a project qualifies for a nationwide permit um, and there is no Endangered Species Act or there's no uh, Section 106 um, impacts associated with it, uh, 45 they're verified in 45 days or less um, and that, because they're that's that's uh well it's by regulation to be honest <clears throat> so application information um the big red bullet at the bottom is very um encouraged uh, the reason i say that is the the process time for the permits that i showed before start when we have a complete application um, the, the where, the what, the how, um, those are all very important. Um, the avoidance and minimization is absolutely essential um, for anything requiring fill. Uh, it's required by EPA's, uh, one of their regulations uh, called the 404B1 guidelines to, um, and our regulations also state that, you know, there's a presumable upland alternative that would have less damaging um, uh, impacts to the aquatic system that could be used. Um, for those that can't be, that have to be cited in an aquatic resource, uh, you have to avoid the resource as much as possible, um, and if unavoidable, you have to minimize to the greatest extent practical. Um, that's very important for you guys to capture in, in your applications. Oftentimes, uh, you've done a lot of avoidance and minimization because uh, the, the more you have to do, the more it costs. Um, to capture those in your application helps us justify uh, issuing or verifying a permit. Um, describe the BMPs to address water quality. I know uh, when I was down here in 2016 or 2017, um, I, I believe uh, DOT started um, putting in pretty much in their, in their contract bids requirements for some of the more green uh, applications, i.e. BMPs and, and other ways. I, I'm so happy to see that happen when I was down here. Uh, it just makes it so much easier on the contractor and it makes it so much easier on you guys to get a, a permit from us. So uh, again, when you're filling out applications, think about the, the how you're avoiding and, and, and minimizing impacts to um, all of the resources, not just aquatic, um, as described in here. The endangered species are uh, essential to describe, um, the essential fish habitat, um, and, and historic properties. Like I said, um, it's, it's really the 106 process here is, is very robust. 
uh, because there are so uh, many properties uh, available um, to be impacted, you know, truly. Moving faster than I thought it was gonna. Um, some of our initiatives that we're, we're doing right now, um, so to try to make things more efficient, which is always the, the, the goal, we have started um, monthly meetings with the State Historic uh, Preservation Division, the SHPO, uh, SHPD, sorry. Um, they've been very productive and we're working on having a programmatic agreement um, for emergency repairs for roads as well as emergency uh, repairs for bridges. Um, it's, it's not going to be a blanket certification because again, every project is um, uh, you know, different. Um, uh, but that being said is it will definitely uh, give a little bit of transparency to you guys as you're moving into the application process. Um, now, that being said is uh, we're also working on developing a coral assessment tool. Um, we've been shopping around the nation to try to find one and there isn't one. Um, and with uh, coral being such a uh, important resource, it's considered a special aquatic site um, under the regulations. Um, impacts to those are very hard to quantify or qualify. So we've been working with different agencies as well as uh, internal um, uh, to try to develop an assessment tool. Uh, the understanding is the Navy is also uh, developing an assessment tool. Don't have a lot of visibility on that one yet, uh, but we're trying to work with them to make sure that the two tools uh, are, are not contradictory, if that makes sense. Um, as I also mentioned, the national uh, nationwide permit renewals currently underway. Uh, like I said, the, oh, the 16 nationwide permits were re reissued in 2021. I thought it was 2020. Uh, I know they went in the federal register in 2021. And um, right now, the, the 40 plus the new one are, 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 are going to come out in 2022, um, that being all, all things considered. Now, um, there are some, uh, uh, some nuances. So the number of uh, regional conditions, which are um, conditions specific to this division, um, have gone down greatly. There's now uh, only four uh, to be considered for the, the current uh, 16 that were uh, reissued in 2021. Um, and there will only be four for the 41 that are to be renewed in 2022. Uh, there are proposed blanket certifications uh, for the 401 process. However, due to a recent court case in Northern California, uh, the, 20, the uh, September 11th, 2020 um, 401 process is now vacated. Uh, so we're um, kind of in stasis, and right now we can't uh, we can't issue any permits until that gets worked out uh, with EPA and, and uh, on a national uh, level. But we anticipate that that it's not going to be too much of a hiccup right now. So the nationwide permits that were issued in, in 2017 are still uh, able to be verified, uh, but the 16 that were issued in 2021 um, are uh, have been vacated, and so right now they're they're on hold. Um, and the 40 plus one. Um, are on hold as well until we get this uh, 401 uh, process figured out a little bit. So I apologize to the public uh, on behalf of all of the, the uh, uh, I guess the, rap the rapidness of all the changes in the, uh, all the laws, uh, you know, within the last four or five years, ESA got revised, uh, the 401 process got revised, um, the nationwide permits have been getting revised, jurisdiction has been revised. Uh, so I can understand why there's a little bit of confusion, but like I said, um, we're here to be uh, to answer those questions. So if you have questions, uh, just pick up the phone or shoot us an email and ask. Um, and where you can do that is right here. Uh, that email is, uh, that's our corporate email, has visibility for many people. Um, I note that Linda Spearstra is the permanent chief here. Uh, she's doing a developmental detail um, in another district right now. Um, so I came down again to, uh, to uh, help out the, this team. Um, but that's that's the phone number to call if you guys have any questions. And if you're going to submit something, uh, there's the, the mail address. Um, it went quicker than I anticipated, but are there any additional questions at this time? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, thank you for that presentation, Shane. Uh, we do have some questions uh, that I will send your way right here. Um, what are some common reasons a permit is denied? Uh, well, the last project I worked on that was denied, it was because um, under the 404B1 guidelines and the public interest review, the project was, was determined not to be in the public's interest. Um, in addition to that, um, the 404B guidelines, uh, we worked with EPA and Fish and Wildlife, um, and it was determined that the project would have significant degradation to aquatic resources, and they couldn't, uh, the applicant could not come up with a compensatory mitigation that would offset those impacts. 
So those are the two most common. Um, that's, that's denied with prejudice. And at that time, uh, the, the project would have to change so substantially that, uh, that it would be primarily a new project uh, for them to come in and reapply. Now, that being said, other permits are denied uh, with a, uh, not with prejudice. So uh, based on if, if we can't get a 401 certification, um, and at that time, we just uh, we deny without prejudice, but it doesn't preclude the applicant from working with, in this case, DOH or one of the other uh, certifying authorities in the, in the other islands. And once they get that 401 water quality certification, uh, we can then issue a permit if it's uh, determined not contrary to the public's interest and, uh, and uh, doesn't have significant degradation to aquatic resources. So, but that, that project, I will say this, um, I don't know what the exact st statistic is, but I would say just less than 5% of applications are denied. Um, now, that being said is um, not many applications that I, that especially the ones that qualify for an individual permit come in, um, get exactly what they want. Um, it's an iterative process. And again, we try to, uh, the process itself leads itself to um, project modification so that we can avoid and minimize to the greatest extent practical. So a lot of, while still fulfilling the, the project's purpose. Um, but or if there's a, an alternative that doesn't involve, um, you know, uh, impacting or destruction of, of aquatic resources, uh, but it's it's not very common, uh, to be honest. But yeah, the, the the last project when I was the program manager um, in Alaska, uh, it got denied and, and is currently in appeal. So we'll see how that comes out. All right. Um, on a separate topic, uh, with the advent of global warming and rising sea level waters, what are the suggestions and techniques that the USACE Develop, are developing and recommending to address the very pressing challenge? <laughs> that, is a, that is quite the question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to put on my regulator's hat again and say, so, you know, to be non-biased, we are not proponents or opponents of projects. We don't prescribe how anybody does anything. Um, and what I mean by that is I don't tell you that you have to put 16 by 16 foot blocks of concrete to stabilize. That's, that is not my job. My job is to really evaluate the impacts to aquatic resources. Now, that being said is I know we're, um, some of our, our uh, specialty shops um, are looking at uh, that exact question. And um, I know there's, there's a, this, is a, this is a real problem, um, you know, both here and Alaska. There's been, uh, we, we have an eroding coastline up there because our sea ice goes out so quick uh, that the storms come in and, and entire villages are being moved. Um, but that's that's the that's the grill in the room right now for sure. Uh, global climate change is real. Uh, I don't care who you ask, um, it is real. And you know, I, I don't know what the initiatives are off the top of my head. Um, but uh, you know, if you guys come up with some good stuff, let us know because we're all in this together for sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are currently no other questions. If anybody has anything, uh, feel free to you know, type it in the Q and A section. I actually have a question for you, Shane. Um, I lived yeah. in Waikiki for a year and a half, and uh, in that time, I saw them fill, put sand on the shore at least twice, trying to, you know, uh, redo the shoreline there. Is that is that something that is a uh, uh, four four permitted as well, or is that just um, is, is they, that not? Yeah, they they got a permit for everything that was below high tide line. Uh, you know, okay. that that's where our authority is. Now, once you get above tide line, uh, high tide line, we don't have any authority over that. But yeah, they, they've been coming and talking to us, um, you know, after those big storm events and stuff like that, so. Right, I mean, yeah, that, that, that beach is just washing away slowly, sure, <laughs> but surely yeah. they can find all they want, but yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, that's for certain. You know, I definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a challenge. As I drive around the island, uh, obviously I, I'm not as familiar with every beach as you guys are, uh, but I've seen a lot of changes in just the last few years, to be honest, it's, it's very notable. Yes. All right. Well, um, there are no other questions. So uh, thank you very, thank you again, Shane, very much. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, the guys, this will conclude our session. Uh, thank you for everyone attending here. And thank you again, Shane, for uh, presenting with your uh, very deep knowledge of the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and uh, all their permitting, regu regulatory permitting. Um, the yeah. next piece, the next session will begin at 11 a.m., guys. Um, you know, so uh, return to the sessions tab to uh, take a look and see what uh, we have coming up. Uh, and also check out the leaderboard to see if you guys are in the lead. But uh, with that, thank you very, very much. And you guys have a great day. Thank you, Logan.